Great video. That is a song um, that every morning after I get done in my quiet time, I always, as I begin to pray, I listen to that song. I don't, I don't watch that video, but I just listen to that song because to me that is a reminder that, Lord, I need you. I, I need you every day. I need you every hour. Lord, I just need you. Uh, I think that is a great testimony in that song, too, that so many of the people were reached uh, by getting the Gideon Bible, you know, uh, from the hotel. I think that's a great ministry. I, I have actually known a couple of people who have served in the Gideon ministry. So that is just a great example of, of reaching people when they're at their lowest is, is, is like that, you know. And so uh, I just want to give you a brief report. You know, Friday night we had our, kind of our first fifth quarter. I know they've done in the past, but uh, it's been a few years. Uh, we had, I think we had around around 45 students that were here. Some had to come and some had to leave early because of other commitments and, and just different things. So um, I just want to say thank you, whether you brought a dessert, whether you came early and started the chili, and whatever you did, to, whether you donated money, whatever you did, you helped advance the gospel, okay? Because I actually gave a gospel presentation. I actually watched the video um, and, 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 and talked about how I wanted to remind the students how they were fearfully and wonderfully made. And talked about no matter where they are uh, in their life, that God loves them. Uh, and we were created in His image. So I just had a chance to share the gospel. Uh, you know, and it was one of those things that uh, you just never know. And so when I gave my little time of invitation, you know, nobody come forward, and that's fine. God, God knows their hearts. And then I was talking to one of the students this morning, and and he was like, "Yeah, I think somebody behind me was trying to under, trying to ask, if, you know, what does that mean?" And he didn't know. So I challenged that student. I don't want to embarrass who they are. Um, I said, "Why don't you Why don't you follow up with them?" And, and, and they said, "Okay." Uh, but this morning we're going to be talking about finding true wisdom. Uh, and I don't always feel like maybe I'm wise. Uh, I am getting a lot of gray hair. And so I know sometimes they say, you know, with wisdom comes lots of gray hair. I, I just think that's having kids and, you know, being in the youth ministry for like 25 years. And I think part of that just comes with that. Uh, so, but if you guys got your Bibles or there's a Bible in front of you or if you don't, if there's not one or if you want to get your phone out, uh, we're going to be in James 3. It's kind of where we're going to be at. Well, again, we're going to talk about wisdom. And I knew when Dan asked me to preach, I knew I wanted to kind of, because the last time I preached, I don't know if you guys remember, I taught out of James. And I was kind of going, and I, I didn't really know if I wanted to keep going exactly. And so I skipped I skipped ahead a little bit, and I come along this, this talking about wisdom from above. And, you know, I thought a lot about, like, my dad. I'll try not to cry and tear up on you guys, but... Uh, I thought about my dad and all the great wisdom, you know, that he bestowed upon me in my life, you know. And I think, I remember one time I was, he had already passed away, and I was doing something at my mom's house. And I was doing something. And she said, what are you going to do that? And I said, well, dad taught me that. And she's like, you know, that's, that's pretty awesome. And I said, you know, I really wish I would have paid a lot more attention when dad was trying to teach me things. Because, you know, when you're a kid... You know, you think you know everything. You know, I remember being a teenager and just thinking, I know, I know that, I know that, I know that. But I, I really wish I would have paid a lot more attention. Because I think, man, I, I really could have gleaned a lot more. Uh, I actually uh, still glean a lot of wisdom from my father-in-law. A uh, great godly man. Uh, very quiet. A lot of you guys have met him. Um, I gleaned a, a lot of wisdom from him. Uh, I remember uh, one time he was having a lot of trouble with, like, his arthritis and carpal tunnel. And so I went over there to cut some wood for him. And he said, you know, could you could you help me change the oil in my trucks? You notice I said trucks. He had like three, that all the all farm trucks. You know, and uh, I I just it, it was we kind of differ sometimes when we do things mechanically, uh, but I didn't say anything. And so uh, Kind of long story short, I ended up taking a screwdriver on one of the oil filters and driving it through there, twisting it because it was on a little tight. And then I got through, I got through, got the very last truck. And, and again, these are farm trucks, so you know, 
And I get under there, the last one, and it's like a plug, it's just like round. Because it was just all one. And I said, I said, how do you get this off? Oh, here's this pipe wrench. And I'm like, oh, great, I'm gonna break this. And so it all worked out good. But I still gleaned a lot of wisdom. But and uh, wisdom is more than more than just knowing facts or details. I mean, it's more about just it's more than just knowing that information. Wisdom is is knowing what to do. Okay, it's knowing what to do. Wisdom does not come easily. Okay, I, I know a lot of us were teenagers once, and we thought we were wise, but we really weren't. Uh, it comes through experience uh, we have. Uh, I remember I had a job one time working at a machine shop, and man, I just learned so much from them guys. Actually, my boss originally apprenticed as a blacksmith, so I learned a lot of his little things that he learned. Uh, it also comes from God, and that's what we're going to focus on today. So I've got a story I'm going to read you guys. It's a, it's a short story. It's about Henry Ford. Most of us know who Henry Ford is. If you young people don't, you can Google him and read all about him. If you have a car or seat car that says Ford on it. He was the original uh, maker. He designed the first, uh, like, kind of like assembly line, putting cars together. You could just really just kick them out. Uh, I like, I think it was the Model T that you could get in any color as long as it was black. That was his slogan. So Henry Ford, the automotive inventor, and the maker needed more power for his plant. Okay? He hired the most qualified person he could find to build him generators. His name was Charles Stinmetz, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, and he, this is a guy, he was a, he was a Polish immigrant. Uh, he was well known as a genius, like math, engineering, I mean, he knew it all. A little while later, however, the generators quit. Ford had his repairmen and anyone else he could find to try to fix them. Since no one came through, Ford called this Stinmetz uh, he worked on the machines for a little while, and soon they were working again. A few days later, Ford got a bill for $10,000. He couldn't understand that uh, statements to explain it, and he said, he replied, tinkering with the generators, $10. Knowing where to tinker, $9,990, and Ford paid the bill. Okay, because well, sometimes, I mean, it was that wisdom, so he knew... He knew exactly what to do because he had that wisdom. So, you know, a lot of this, a lot of the way, a lot of times the way when I bring a message, whether it's to students or adults, I kind of I'll do it the same. So, do you live your life wisely? No, you don't need to answer that a lot, but I want you to think about it. Do you live your life wisely? I mean, is it always focused on what the scripture tells you? So again, today we're going to be in James, and we're going to start in three and go through eighteen. But we're going to learn some important information about what wisdom is and what it is not. So if you guys got your like I said, your Bibles, or there's one in front of you, or get your phone. James three, verse thirteen. It said, "Who is wise and understanding among you? But his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom." But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambitions in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambitions exist, there will be disorder in every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy, full of good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Uh, let's, I'm going to open this up in prayer. Father God, as we just come before you, God, as we just have opened your word, God, may we all, um, I know for me personally, God, I need to strive harder to be more wise and to truly gain that wisdom from you. God, just thank you again for today. Thank you that we're here worshiping in word and opening your scripture and worshiping in offering. I ask all this in your name. Amen. So here's some beginning thoughts. I, do, I didn't have a bottle of water, so don't shoot me for having a cup. And it is water. I already had coffee. So God's wisdom can be seen through our lifestyles. And that's talking in that first part of 13. Is who is wise and understanding among you? 
So he's asking that question. Who is it? It's by good conduct. Let him show his works. So we should we have that wisdom by our lifestyles. You know, so what's our lifestyles look like? We're all different. We all have different lifestyles. We all have different families. We all have different kids. So what does that look like for you? God's wisdom teaches us humility. And that's in that verse 13, the second half. By his good conduct, let him show his works in a meekness of wisdom. You know, what does it mean to be meek? And what does it mean to be, you know, humble? You know, we need to, you know, we always, and it's, I think Jesus is the best example of what this looks like. You know, to be, to be meek and to be wise and to be humble. Okay? Humility translates gentleness and is often used in describing a well-trained horse. It is a picture of power under control. So if you think of a horse and, and pulling wagons, I know one time we were, uh, we were in the St. Louis area, so we went to a place called Grant's Farm, uh, and it's actually where they, they house the Clydesdales. If you've ever been up close to a Clydesdale, I mean, they are huge in how massive and how much power that they have to them, but it's having that power and having all that gentleness and being under control. So sometimes we need to figure out how, to, how do we control that. Okay, first James shows us uh, what, it, what wisdom is not. And I had John read this. And so, uh, actually, let me back up. So James 3, uh, so this is kind of what wisdom is not, is what he shares with his first, is what James. Um, so in 14 and 15, he showed, it is shown in jealousy and selfishness. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambitions in your heart, do not boast and be false to the truth. Okay, what is truth? Truth is the gospel. Truth is that God loves us. Truth is that Jesus died for us, and then three days later he's risen from the dead. And then he ascended to heaven and sat at the right hand of God. That's truth. And we also got to remember James, and again, James, this is the brother of Jesus. They're pretty sure, I mean, they're not 100%, but they, they this, and remember, when Jesus was first started his ministry, his brothers and family didn't believe. Okay? And it wasn't until he died and probably was raised from the dead that they thought, oh, wow, you know, I've I seen all this, but I never believed. So it is shown in jealousy and selfishness. But we also got to remember that James is writing this to the church. So James is writing this to us. I love the book of James, but I kind of don't like the book of James. Because it gives us very specific things of to, to not do and very specific things of to do. And I know a lot of people don't like to read James because, to be honest, none of us like people to tell us what to do. Even as adults, we don't always like people to tell us what to do. Okay? And I'm going to use, I didn't get permission, but I always have permission from Melissa to share stories about her. We were, uh, this was actually before we actually moved here. We were going to a concert at, uh, in uh, Kansas City. And, uh, and we didn't know this. And after 9-11, like when you go to a big venue like that, you're not allowed to take your purse or any kind of bag. Now, you can if it's clear. So a lot of ladies were walking in here like clear purses. So you can see in there. So we proceed to go in. And this lady's kind of rude to Melissa, saying, you can't bring that bag in here. You know, you can't do this. And I could kind of tell that Melissa was miffed a little bit. Sorry. And, and I think it all had to do with the way the lady handled it. But, you know, Melissa just really didn't like this young girl telling her what to do. Sorry. So... Uh, but she ended up taking her purse back and, you know, she vented to one of the other workers when we went back and went through the security and all that, so she felt better. So, envy and selfishness, ambitions can slowly consume a person. So, we, if, we, if we're envy and we're selfish, then admit we're all selfish. We all like, you know, when it comes to life, and you know, when you have little kids, you never get to watch what you want to watch. You never get to do what you want to do. But there is times when we're just like, okay, this is what we're going to do. So I am a little selfish sometimes. 
I do know when we travel, if they're not anywhere near a Chick-fil-A, we have to eat there. That is the only rule that we have when I travel. And that's with students, mission trips, you can ask Miss Betty. Uh, you know, Miss Betty's like, we're gonna eat a Chick-fil-A. Uh, I just like their food, I like what they stand for, and I won't preach on that today. Uh, but we need to pray that we get more close. Uh, that person is always comparing himself or horse herself to others and trying to get what they have. You know, I mean, that's that's just who we are. That's our country. That's our that's our society. That people are selfish and they always want what they have. They always want. And a great example is cell phones. How often do cell phones new cell phones come out? Like every year. There's I don't know what's the newest. Uh, what's the newest iPhone? iPhone 11. iPhone 11. Do you know how long an average iPhone will last? Several years. And now they do this thing that, well, if you turn it in early and you upgrade, you know, we'll, we'll give you a, we'll give you the, we'll give you this new app price. You know, uh, I actually went in uh, a while back and uh, was talking about getting a cell phone. And, man, they're just expensive. They're just high. And the guy was like, and I like, I prefer the galaxies. I just do, that's just who I am, don't judge me. Um, that's just who I am. And, and he's like, well, which one do you have? And I said, well, I have the uh, S6. You know, and he's like, oh, wow. Yeah, 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 you need to upgrade. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't really need to upgrade, but you know, you see all these features and these cool stuff, and you know, you can, uh, cut glass with it or whatever you want to do with it. You know, it's got all these cool stuff. Uh, the second one is that uh, kind of having that world. It is not, it is a non, the false, the false wisdom is a non-Christian worldview. You can think many different ways. False wisdom is not Christ-like. It is a uh, it is an unspiritual way of thinking about life. And we're, again, in verse fifteen, it says, "This is not this is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. It is not from God. It is not from above. It's not from God. And if you think of things that are earthly and unspiritual, or even demonic, it's like whoa." That's like really, really scary to think of some people that would have wisdom that's unspiritual or demonic. True wisdom comes from heaven. Uh, and I had John read this. James 1, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. All we got to do is ask for that wisdom. All we got to do is ask. You know, so many times I think of, uh, I, know, I know my kids, and, you know, I'll say, well, if you need something, just ask. Just, you know, what do you need? Just ask. You know, dad will say, well, you always say no, dad. You know, that's just part of being a dad, you know. Uh, it causes more problem than it, than it solves. Verse 16, for more the jealousy and selfish ambition exists, there will be disorder in every vile practice. Again, James is writing this, he's writing this to the Christians. He's writing this to us. He's writing this, writing, this, writing this to the church. He's saying that, you know, false wisdom results in confusion and sin. That's really what all this comes back down to. Because if you've got false wisdom, you know, it's going to cause confusion. It's going to cause problems. So a reminder, verse 14, 14 through 16 gives us a glimpse of what wisdom is not. You know, uh, and I think of the times that we give rules to either our children or, or the students or any time we do where I have rules, and, and I'm big on rules. I'm just, I'm big on rules. Because I really believe, and I tell students, and I tell Thad, and I told Hannah, that you need to learn to follow rules, okay? Because if you can't follow my rules, you're going to have trouble following God's rules. And, you know, sometimes my rules might be like, you know, kind of, they might be like, well, that's kind of dumb. Well, I don't really care. It's my rule. 
It's my responsibility. I'm your authority. I need you to follow me. So that, again, the next two verses are going to show. We're going to talk about what wisdom. And I keep looking at that clock. We need to set that clock because I'm thinking, oh, I got it. man, I went way over. Uh, but again, read the James three seventeen through eighteen. But the wisdom from above is first pure and peaceful, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is shown in peace by those who make peace. Kind of a, a picture of a true, truly wise person is, and I'm going to go through, and if you, if you guys want to write these down, you can, if you're taking notes, but I've got like eight things I'm going to share with you. What? A picture of a truly wise person. Okay? But before I move forward, I want you guys to think of somebody you've had in your life a very godly person that you thought they are truly wise. They're just truly wise, truly wise. So, um, and kind of this picture, number one is that he protects his purity, okay? Um, even as an adult, I have to protect my purity. I have to be careful of what I watch, what I listen to, what I look at, okay? And in a world that is just always in our face, with the way people dress, the way people act. I just don't want, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to see it. So what, what are some areas in which you sometimes compromise your purity? Are you thinking, well, that, that movie's not too bad. That song's not too bad. You know, it's not all bad. Okay. The second one is he stands for peace. Peace is mentioned three times in these two verses. It is a warning for those with warning for those with quick tempers and those who love to argue. How many of us, how many of us have somebody in our family that loves to argue? Okay, whether it's one of your children, you know, Thad kind of raised his hand. Uh, whether it's our spouse, or whether it's you know. Somebody in our family, don't point fingers, we're in church, you know, don't point at anybody, but we all have people, whether we people I work with, whether we people are, you know, and they always say, never talk, like at work, never talk about politics or religion, because people are going to argue with you, you know, and so sometimes, just people love to argue just because they love to argue. So he stands for peace, Okay. He responds with kindness. Think about how an, and then it's, think about a person and how they act. Think about that inconsiderate person and how they act. Why is it wise to be considerate to others? And I think the answer to that is, so we'll look like Jesus. You know, think of Jesus' life. I mean, he was considerate. What did Jesus do? He healed their physical needs first and then took care of their spiritual needs. You know, it's hard to tell somebody about Jesus when they're hungry or when they're cold. So he was always considerate. You know, are we considerate of others? Do we always think about others? Do we always look at other people and think, well, I wonder if they need a ride? Or I wonder if they'll, you know, I wonder if they need food. Uh, I wonder if they need to cut it. I noticed today, you know. Uh, and I see that on my on my bus route. I see a lot of kids um, that will just, you got, and I don't know, if, and some of it may even be the parents, you know. We're always telling our kids, you need to put a coat on. You need to put a coat on. You need to put a coat on. It's not cold out. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You guys are all in there. We've got kids. You know, you have to tell them it's cold out. It's cold out. Because uh, you always just take a coat. You always just take a coat. So I've got some kids that get on. I mean, they're wearing shorts still. They like it this week. They've got some of them maybe your kids, and they've got you know maybe a hoodie on, and that's about it. Okay. And I know they go to school. It's good for them, but you never know. And I've got some kids that get on, get on. They've got so much wearing clothes on already that they can't really move. And you know when you got a pre-K or trying to take that first big step on the bus, and they've got so much clothing on they can't move. It's kind of funny. 
But we need to remind, be remembered of, and be considered of others that when we see them, you know, what's going on in their life? I wonder if they do need a coat. I wonder if they do need a hat. I wonder if they do need gloves. Okay? He is willing to obey. Think about some people that you should be submissive to. And I know as an adult, we don't always like to submit to other people's authority. Do we? Whether it's, it's a spouse, whether it's a, a, a boss, whether it's maybe a, another co-worker that's not the boss but they think they are. And sometimes they might be put in that authority of, of being the boss. And sometimes you think, well, you don't really know what you're doing. But what a great example is when someone is over you and they, you submit to that authority of whether you agree 100% with that or not. You know, again, Jesus was truly obedient. You know, when he was in the garden, and he literally sweated drops of blood. This is a true medical issue. That you get so stressed that you're sweating drops of blood that he was still willing to be obedient to God. So he's willing to... He forgives people when they make mistakes. A wise person understands that everyone makes mistakes, so he forgives others when they mess up. You know, sometimes, and I don't personally, I'm not always the nicest person when somebody makes a mistake, because I'm always, I don't want you to sign up again, I don't want you to do that again, because, you know, you made that mistake. And I know as a parent, it's really hard to go to your child and say, I'm sorry I messed up. Made a mistake. It's really hard because we think that we need to be, as a parent, we think we need to be perfect. But we don't. We need to be forgiving when people make a mistake. You know, because I know people learn from mistakes. You know, I'll never forget, I wasn't very old, I had just started mowing yards. I was probably like, like eight. So you kids think eight, he's like working. Yeah, when we were younger, we worked. Because I wanted money. And that's the way I was going to get it. And that's what my dad told me. You want money, you got to work. And I was mowing the neighbor's yard. And again, we didn't have a rider. We, I pushed all my yards. I didn't have a weed eater. I had those little hand clippers. You remember those? And I'd crawl around on my hands and knees. And I'd clip around everything. And I'd do that. And, you know, I got paid like four or five bucks. Okay. Now, granted, gas was like 89 cents a gallon. You know, so it was just, everything was a lot cheaper. But I remember this one time, um, the mower died, okay? And I was at the mower in the house next door. So I go get my dad, and I said, hey, dad, the mower won't start. He's like, well, grab hold of the spark plug. And I did, and then my dad pulled the cord. And I'm like, ah! You know, and he's like, yeah, it's getting fire. And I'll never forget that. Okay, I will never forget that until the day I die. Okay, because it's a good little jolt. If you've ever touched the spark plug, and that was, I mean, that's a, that's a good little, uh, that's a good little reminder. But, again, I'll never forget that. That's, that's something you gain from wisdom. Now, at the time, I thought it was kind of cruel that he would do that. But uh, I don't even remember what the problem was. He tinkered with it and got it going. It's just, my dad was amazing to do stuff like that. But a wise person understands that everyone makes mistakes. So he forgives others when they mess up. You know, I think, and Jesus and the disciples, think of all the times that the disciples messed up. Okay? And Jesus would have said, okay, you're out. You know, he wouldn't have had anybody. But he was taking a group of, a group of men and that were messed up. And used them as a great example. And I think of all of us, we're all messed up. And I know... And I've heard people say, I've heard Dan say this several times, I've heard other people that they say, well, I'm looking for the perfect church. And I'm like, good luck. Because when you find it, you know, let the rest of us know. He does good things for other people. Good fruit here is, when you talk about good fruit, is a symbolic of positive outcome. So just do good. Uh, and I don't... I don't like to brag on myself. I don't like to talk about the good things I've done, but I like to do things without people knowing, okay? 
And I remember when I, we were actually living in Springfield and I was serving at a church there. And we had this sweet little old lady that lived, lived next door. Her name was Edna May. Uh, and most of the time we only saw Edna May because she worked at Walmart. She was a greeter. And she worked like till like 11 or 12 o'clock at night. And so she was always getting home late. So every time it snowed and I'd shovel my driveway, I would shovel hers. Just to be nice. You know, to be good, you know, just, you know, just to be nice, just because I thought it was a nice thing to do. And I did it several times before she ever, ever caught me, okay? And so it was just, I just did it because it was nice, you know? And I don't see a lot of that in some of the younger generations. I don't see kids doing nice things, you know? And they're not learning it from their parents. They're not learning them from us. And so whether it's a, a grandchild or a child or a kid in the community, they have to learn this stuff from us. So he does good things for people. And that's what the gospel is about. That's what ministry is about, is about people. And I always, I always joke a little bit with some of my ministry friends. And I've joked with Dan a little bit. I said, you know, Ministry would be a lot easier if we didn't have to deal with people. You know, and it's a little bit of a joke, but that's who we are. That's what we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to be good to people. We're, we need to be, do good things. Okay? Uh, and if you're numbering these, this is number seven. He treats all people with respect. Why is, why is it wise to treat people with respect and impartiality? I think, again, it, it just... Makes us and it be an example to be like Christ. Whether it's somebody that a homeless person, and you know, sometimes we just think, man, why don't they get a job? But you know, when you're homeless and you don't have an address, you can't put that down on your application, and you don't have clean clothes, so you can't go in and have a good interview. You know, because I was always taught, you know, your interview is always about presentation. And so I always make sure I dress nice, like a business casual. And so it's to show that respect. But sometimes we look at people and think, you know, I really wish I'd just get a job. But you know, when you're homeless, you can't get a job because you don't have a home address. You don't have anywhere to change your clothes. Excuse me. You don't have anywhere to shower. So I think sometimes we just need to learn to show, show people some respect and impartiality. We can, so I think sometimes Christians are so we so we're so judging of other people, and we think, man, if they would only come to church. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking, we need to do it the other way. If only we would go to them, you know, because that's what Jesus did. Jesus went to them. He just didn't, you know, say, okay, today at church, if you come forward, I'm going to tell you about how to have eternal life. No, he went to them. He went to where they were at. You know, I think a great example of that was when he went and talked to the woman at the well. You know, she was there getting water when no one else was. And then she kind of freaked out because Jesus started talking to her. And was basically like, do you know, kind of like, do you know who I am? Do you know why I'm here? You know, and again, in the Jewish culture, you know, you didn't, men didn't talk to women. Especially a woman like this. But he told her how to not only get water, but to get that eternal water. And it never be thirsty again. Number eight, he lives with integrity. The word used here for literally means without a disguise. So to have integrity, when someone has integrity, you're just like, oh, man, I want some of that. They, they just, they just, man, look at that integrity. They just, they just glow. They gleam. You're just like, wow, look at that. James just reminds us of the sides. Signs of true wisdom, like wisdom itself, they are not easily and must be worked at. When we live with true wisdom, our lifestyles honor God. So remember, truly, we're going to get ready and, and have our time of invitation. We're going to get ready to close. Uh, we're going we're to sing a song. Um, but I want to remind you that he, per, he, per, he uh, protects his purity. He stands for peace. He responds with kindness. He's willing to obey. He forgives people when they make mistakes. He does good things for other people. He treats all people with respect. He lives with integrity.
And this is just a great example. And if you want to copy this, I can copy this. And then, you know, it says he, he meaning us, you, me, all of us. So as we get ready to sing, I, I got three questions I want to ask you. Do you see yourself as wise? Do you see yourself as wise? And you might think, well, I'm pretty wise. I, I'm good with money. And, you know, I, you know, I'm pretty good. I do this, I do that. But are you truly that, that, have that godly wisdom? Can you stand up and, I'm sorry. and I know I have some people in my life that, man, when I need godly wisdom, I need to know who to go to. I really do. 